Hello and welcome to uh, our webinar today, Dealing with Disruption. My name is Dominic Lukes. I was convener of the Business Continuity Working Group. Um, together we developed a new web tool to help businesses understand and manage their risks, supply chain risks. I've since left FPA and Risk Authority, got a new job in a new industry, but before I left, I was asked to put together this webinar, talk more widely about supply chain issues and to do a run through of our toolkit, and which I was delighted to do. So, supply chain, I've just put a few examples here. These are some quite well known major brands. Not saying our members are obsessed with fried chicken and beer, but I just thought these were a couple of really good examples. KFC was put into the spotlight in 2018. <clears throat> um, the fast food giant had appointed DHL as its new logistics partner on the 14th of February. And, it's, and DHL operated from a single warehouse in Rugby. Uh, whereas the previous uh, logistics partner to, D, uh, to KFC was Bidfist Logistics. I think they're called something else now. <clears throat> but they previously had six warehouses. And then on the 14th of February, about 2 o'clock in the morning, there was this major collision between seven or eight vehicles and the police had closed uh, the junctions two and three on the M6 motorway. <coughs> And shortly after, um, a, pair of, uh, a pair of lorries collided near Junction 1. So these three junctions, all in close vicinity, uh, vicinity of Rugby, which is where DHL's warehouse is located. And immediately the lorries were getting stuck as soon as they left the depot. And with no other locations to, to send deliveries from, um, KFC were, were immediately you know, against the wall and their decision to transport a perishable product from just one location, one single depot, was immediately brought under, under question. And the, this consolidation of warehouses also happened at the same time with a new IT system, new supply relationship to bed down. So immediately KFC were, you know, <clears throat> were being brought into question about the the level of planning that had gone in, uh, that had been undertaken, and what sort of contingency measures were in place. Pretty soon after, within a couple of days, in fact, KFC started to shut down locations in response to not having any chicken. And by the 18th of February, only 266 of the 870 restaurants were, were actually open, and many of those were operating from a from a limited uh, menu. The net effects, KFC saw immediate 2% fall in sales, 5% fall in operating profit in that quarter. They also since have renewed um, the agreement with Bidfist Logistics. They originally awarded them the Northern contract. And I read in the paper about a month ago, they've actually gone back to Bidford Logistics. They're called something else now, but essentially they've, they've cut ties with DHL and they're back to where they were previously. <coughs> Heineken, Heineken, the, you know, the beer uh, manufacturer, back in the summer, um, if you think about, you know, the, the heat wave, the, the, the England football teams run to, to the World Cup semi-finals, uh, the, the demand for beer was pretty high at the time. Well, as it happened, there was a chronic shortage of carbon dioxide. This affected many industries, veterinary, dentistry, but it also affected the beer industry because it's used to provide the fizz, um, not just in beer, but in, in soft drinks. So Heineken, the, the brewer, was left to write to all, its, all the large pubs and asked them not to place um, any orders with them. <coughs> which is a strange thing to have to do, but essentially they were they were running low on their emergency reserves of, of carbon dioxide. So again, there was question marks over, over stockpiling, contingency, having alternative sources of supply, or all, all, all the things that are, that are part of having a resilient supply chain. 
Unipart and, and McColls were, again, both similar um, logistic issues, and you can find those online. And then there's many, many other, many other case studies from smaller organisations. <coughs> I was watching the news um, a couple of months ago, local news. There's this company manufacturing machine tools based in Redditch called Hella, and their managing director was on, on camera explaining about the Brexit and the long delays um, at Dover and the fact that they were having to shut down large parts of their uh, of their factory because they just didn't have the tools and raw materials to, to, to carry on at full capacity. <clears throat> so supply chain is obviously becoming a big issue now. There's, there's, there's lots of examples of, um, of companies suffering supply chain disruption. And it's starting to um, demand a lot of boardroom attention. Um, but why is it on the increase? Um, well, I think it's important to understand exactly what is meant by the supply chain. And whilst there's many definitions, this is one that I've that I come across. And it's <clears throat> the system, process, and activities of sourcing raw materials or components. An enterprise needs to create a product or service and to deliver that product or service to customers. <clears throat> so immediately it becomes clearer why supply chain risks are so prevalent and why businesses are uh, experiencing interruptions on a, on a frequent basis. So causes. <clears throat> um, these are some of the top causes of supply chain disruption um, that were highlighted in the Business Continuity Institute Supply Chain Resilience Report from 2018. Uh, accidents, big one, fire, explosions, hazardous spills, anything that might deny access to a factory or, or, or any sort of manufacturing plant, close down um, operations for any length of time, shortage of skilled labour, uh, adverse weather and, nat and natural catastrophes, um, cyber attacks and data breaches, they're becoming a lot more common now. <coughs> and then transport network disruption. And again, that's referring back to the definition of supply chain and the delivery of the final product to the customer. So of course, transport and delivery is, is a key element and um, any sort of disruption will, 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 will create problems. Future causes of supply chain failure. Um, these are ones that um, that I've just been thinking about. Top is trade wars, Trump and um, the ongoing tariffs and um, increases that he's putting on the on on China imports, and of course Brexit. Um, at time of recording, I don't know what's going to happen with Brexit. Probably by the time you you're listening to this webinar, we still don't know what's going to go on with Brexit. <clears throat> but at the moment, it's causing some. Uh, major delays at um, at custom ports. Um, stricter environmental regulations. So there's a lot more local air quality policies being introduced across the Asia Pacific now, with some major fines for 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 companies for polluting um, air quality. The increased waiting times. Again, just not EU and UK, and UK, but US, Mexico. And, and at very other places across the world, um, drones. So there's been a lot of issue with dro uh, drones causing um, problems at UK airports, which again is a risk to to those <coughs> using aviation to um, carry out their logistics and delivery to to customers. <coughs> and then finally, um, climate change. With companies likely to face an increasing number of weather-related disruptions. So, why is supply chain interruption on the rise? Well, there's no doubt that market globalisation has um, had an impact here um, by being connected to a greater number of supplier plants, facilities, service providers. It increases the likelihood of your business suffering a supply chain disruption somewhere in the network. Um, it's difficult to predict. A lot of the um, 
top causes that I've spoken about before, accidents, shortage of skilled labour, um, and adverse weather, cyber attacks, they, they are difficult to predict um, and they're difficult to plan for. There's a lack of visibility as well throughout the supply chain. Um, and also supply chains becoming a lot more complex um, with multiple tiers. Um, and then just generally with business continuity, it's just not a top priority for, for many businesses. But what are the advantages of a robust supply chain? Well, <coughs> that's that old adage, fail to prepare, prepare to fail for a start. But generally, it gives more consumer confidence. Um, if, if you're a company that's been suffering many um, interruptions to your supply chain, um, it, it will affect the, the confidence of your consumers. Um, it helps support your corporate social responsibility policies as well. Um, the picture there, the corned beef isn't by accident. I was reading The Independent a couple of weeks ago. <coughs> and it's found that um, tins of corned beef are finding themselves in many of the UK supermarkets that were linked to arable farmers, arable farmers, livestock farmers, cutting down swathes of the Amazon rainforest. And, um, you know, and and there's rightly backlash to 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 those um, to those supermarkets and the picture underneath. Obviously, the the fashion industry for a long time has been linked with slave labour or uh, third world uh, working conditions. And um, again, it just it helps to support your CSI if you've got um, full visibility of your supply chain. <coughs> You can also react quicker to market disruption. There's lower cost of recovery if you've got these plans in place. And then just generally there's greater protection of your of your brand and profit. So with all this going on, it was felt that having something available to help organizations, businesses to understand the impact of any supply chain failure would be a good thing to do. And that's what we'd like to do at Risk Authority help businesses. So we looked at this tool. Um, it was going to be uh, easy to use and it was going to just provide telltale indicators for each supplier and their perceived risk based on their gross profit dependency, the supply resilience to disruption and the mitigation plans and options that were already in place. And then it would help businesses focus their supply chain planning efforts on those suppliers rated high risk. <clears throat> so this is probably when I need to start diving in and out of um, PowerPoint screens and websites. Um, so just bear with me. So this is the website, riskauthorityspplychain.com. So. If you come to this page, hopefully you can see this all okay. Um, I'm just going to go in and do the self, um, just create an account. So if you've not signed up for an account, this is what we ask you to do. The first thing to say is that the this is all self-service. So as a, as a member, um, we don't ask you to get too involved in this setup. Um, the account is an individual. And the data that we ask from them is data capture purposes only. None of this information is used to drive the actual tool. It's just used for reporting purposes only. And we like to think we kept the registration relatively straightforward. It's not too intrusive. So we ask for the company name, 
company turnover, their number of employees, the insurer, uh, the business sector, and the business type. And these business sectors and business types are actually um, linked back to the business and property protection portal. They use the same sort of categories. They say if you use education, these are your drop down list from there. <coughs> the company logo, this just a helps provide a bit more ownership to, to their accounts and the communications that you send through the tool can carry the brand in as well. So I'll be showing you in a bit, but essentially this company, when, it, when you cut your account, by adding your logo, when you send resilience um, questionnaire forms to your suppliers, it will carry your brand in, so hopefully it will resonate a bit more with the, with the suppliers. Scroll down, just put in your first name, last name, email, secondary email. We have a few prompts here uh, on occasion when we think there might be a bit more explanation required. So, for instance, the secondary email, this will be used for account-related inquiries in the event the primary email is no longer active. <coughs> so this is just an opportunity to put a generic account. So if the person who's created this has, has left the organization or whatever, you can just easily reset the account using the generic email address. We ask for job titles, address, postcode, how you heard about the site. And then at the bottom, um, passwords confirm password and then we just ask them to tick here to agree to the terms and conditions. This helps us to time stamp them uh, agreeing to these conditions. And then we ask if they'd like any more information. <coughs> it's probably worth me just mentioning at this time about the terms and conditions. <coughs> Excuse me. These are being fully reviewed and signed off by FPA solicitors. Um, they follow best practice data security now. Um, and you can see that we've also got privacy notices and cookie policies as well. So these these secure, uh, these terms and conditions are um, pretty thorough and um, very precise. After that, you get a automated email just to say click this link, and from there you are ready to go. So hopefully you agree, not too intrusive, relatively straightforward, and pretty instant access. <coughs> so I'm just going to go back into the account that I've created, one that I made earlier. So obviously as a new customer, you'd um, uh, sorry, a new a new account um, holder, you would have a blank dashboard. And the thing to say here is that there's an inline manual that's been built to help you every step of, uh, um, along the way of how to create and add suppliers, how to create assessments, and how to access resources. But I'll be uh, creating one of these as well. <clears throat> so straight away, as you can see, the, the value here is of a populated dashboard. So for an insurer, as soon as you step in and come to this company, this is just a, a bogus company that I've set up that specialise in baby purees. Those that know me relatively well will, will, will know why I've gone down that route. I've got a little six-month baby girl who are just weaning on various purees. Um, so it seems to be something I know quite a bit about at the moment. But you can see straight away from the dashboard, okay, I've got all these suppliers here. Two of them are determined as high risk. Why they're determined as high risk? Well, we can we can dive in and have a look at that in a moment. But <clears throat> straight away, it just gives you that oversight from an insurer that if you were going to a company, you can see where the big dangers are to them. And it would be up to you whether you, you look at these medium and low risk companies. So moving away from the dashboard, if you go onto the, the supplier screen, Okay, that's not supposed to happen. Just bear with me. I think I might have just been timed out. Okay. 
there we go right fine sorry about that okay so your suppliers so straight away you can see these are all my different suppliers so like i said i'm specializing in various um baby purees and you can see that here for instance i've got Batsy potatoes i can see that the last review was done today this is the contact name contact email i can see that we've done three assessments for him and one of them's come back as medium risk and two has come back as high risk <clears throat> and that's why that supply has been determined as a high risk all the others i believe well one assessment one completed um there's one tbc here so but again straight away you can see here's all my suppliers and these are the results of the assessments that have been done linked to that supplier <coughs> So if I wanted to create a new supplier, nice and simple, come in here, click on create new supplier, uh, name the supplier, let's go with Don's Peas, just put in some garbage on this, um, we'll just put in a bogus email address here. Address then you can add contacts so straight away you can see that the the, the toolkit is trying to guide people through in an, in an interactive way to say look you haven't got any contacts set up here add a new contact so this could be me Um, my job title, let's put me as, and then again, and then if you click save, <coughs> you can see down here, there I am, I listed as a new supplier. So there, those NAs is because we haven't got any assessments. Um, against that supplier and I, I'll show you how to go about doing that now so if you click into assessments <coughs> create new assessment here is your drop down menu this is one you can choose from all your list of suppliers and there's Dom's Peas enter the name of the item service supplied by your supplier that has been obsessed so here we can put Peas and this might be, hmm, I don't know. Yeah, we could do pea and cauliflower puree. That's a nice prompt. I don't know if babies can have pea and mint puree, but we'll go for it anyway. And then you put in your impact on gross profit. Again, you get another little uh, prompt uh, tool tool tip to help people um, to help users understand what's required here. Peas are my best sellers. I'm going to say we have about a gross profit of about 12%. So that would be if Dom's Peas was no, no longer able to supply me peas, what would be the impact on the gross profit for me as a business? And then you click create down here at the bottom. And here's your assessment. So you can see it's got me down as the supplier, contact name, there's the email address. These are the list of products and services that are affected. That's the impact on gross profit. If for any reason you've got that gross profit wrong or you want to add a new product or service that might have been affected. So say I start releasing a P and I don't know, pea and, pea and potato puree. And I need to increase that from 12 to 15%. You can save those changes. This is where the toolkit gets quite clever because you've got two options here. 
this send form to supplier will do exactly that. It will send this suite of questions, this set of questions, seven questions, direct as a, a secure web page for the supplier, i.e. me, at Dom at Pworld here, to answer. So I would get an email come through saying this company name, Dom's Pure Age Limited, whatever, um, have you done as a supplier to their business? Can you answer these questions? And depending, um, so that's sent as a web link. They they go in, they have no access to any other part of the tool, just those list of seven questions. There's a time um, and date and name stamp on those. <coughs> And I've got some screenshots to show you how that looks um, later on in my presentation. And then you get an automated email to come back to say that person has completed the form and it pre-populates those questions and then gives it a rating. Because that's quite complicated and because obviously this DOM at pworld.co.uk email address doesn't exist, <coughs> I'm just going to do the form myself just to give you an understanding of the questions and answers. So can they supply your business from multiple locations? And here's the, the list of answers. And these are weighted accordingly. If you click yes, they can supply from multiple number of different locations. And obviously that will score less highly, uh, more highly than if no, then you operate from a single site and production line. I'm going to say no, but we have multiple production lines within our single site location. Do we have any reciprocal agreements in place? So again, you'll be scored according to what you what you answer here. I'm going to say no. Is the supplier reliant on other suppliers? I'm going to say no. <coughs> have we got a documented and tested business continuity plan? Yes. Has there been any interruption in supply in the last 12 months? Again, if you drop down here, depending on what you answer, I'm going to say there's been one incident. Can the supplier replenish your business within the required timescales? So you've got an option of no. Yes, this is reviewed and included within our contractual service level agreement. Yes, this has been tested and verified within the last 12 months. So I'm going to say it's in our um, SLA. And then finally, does the supplier consider you one of their top five customers? I'm going to say no. And then if you click Save Changes, <coughs> Down, you can see that that's been scored as a medium. And then the final part of the assessment is mitigation assessment. So this is what me as a company owner can do to minimise any risk of a disruptive um, a, a, a disruption in the supply. So again, if you click on the edit form, it starts to ask you about what period of stock do you hold. Because this is a food item, I'm just going to say we've got about a week. If supply is interrupted, how quickly can you make up for lost output? So we can make it up in about a week. Do you have multiple sources of suppliers? I'm going to say yes. Have you identified other alternative suppliers? I'm going to say yes. Are alternative options available to supply your customer? I'm going to say no. And then click save. And you can see See that result there is a medium risk. And then if you go back to your dashboard, there they are, classed as a, as a medium risk. It's as simple as that, to be honest. Um, so you can have multiple assessments against the supplier. So you can see here, Batsy Potatoes, we've got three three assessments completed. And if you click through there, you can see the details here. So Batsy Potatoes, they supply my crisps. That's the impact on gross profits. The supply resilience score there is low. Again, if you click this button here, you can look at the assessment in detail. And you can see here why this is been classed as a high risk item because the supply resilience has come back low. <coughs> um, 
let's go back to all assessments. This page here has lists of all the assessments that you've got, so not just attached to any supplier, but all the assessments. So again, from an insurer point of view, you can really dive in here and see straight away right, what's of high risk to this business. And you can see two of them are attached to Badsley Potatoes, and the other one is to Eva Pack Products Limited, who are doing my packaging for all my purees. <coughs> one set of um, TBC, these are just because elements of the assessment is still outstanding. Either the supply resilience form hasn't been completed or the mitigation assessment form hasn't been completed. Elsewhere in the toolkit, we've got a resources section. Alongside the tour, we produce this simple guide to supply chain management. Let me just quickly open that up. And this guide talks through some of the issues of supply chain, why it's important. Talks about the common risks of supply chain failure. These are ones that I've covered previously in the uh, in the webinar. And then it looks at what they can do to help manage the risk. And here it's about prioritising your suppliers, which is what this toolkit is trying to do. It's um, you know it's helping businesses understand the criticality of their suppliers just by answering a, a relatively simple set of multiple choice questions. And once these questions are scored, it just helps you understand straight away which suppliers would have the greatest impact on your ability to to continue supply to your customers. <clears throat> and then it comes across with some other solutions that, that might just help min minimize the risk, which is spreading your supplies geographically. Um, you know, if you've got a high concentration of suppliers based in, in one area of the world, which might be prone to earthquakes or, or hurricanes or, or whatever, um, that's when it might be worth looking at, uh, at having um, suppliers spread more more widely. And we then talk about managing your, your supplier relationships, trying to get on top of the packing order if there's any there's any issues or trying to understand about the supplier a bit more and having that dialogue undertaking a bit of research and the them if they've got any continuity plans in place and then about researching um, alternative suppliers uh, keeping inventory stock and then service level agreements and then finally um, having those discussions with, with, with the insurer as well. So it's a nice little simple guide for, for businesses as well. So that's a quick look through the tool. Just wider on this um, so again, I just wanted to show you how the, how the toolkit looked if, you, if you're a, a new account holder. So you can see that it talks you through the process of adding new suppliers to the account <coughs> with, the, with this inline manual. The supplier setup, which I've already shown you, so you can have multiple contacts attached to a, to a supplier. And then, of course, you can have multiple products and services affected as well, as you saw with my with my P example, you know, if you can attach multiple products, which will have an effect on, on of course, the gross profit. <clears throat> and then we've gone through the assessment screen as well, so it's split out into three. This first bit talks about the impact, the products affected, the supplier, the contact, and then you have these two um, two questionnaire forms, simple. Uh, drop-down questionnaires that look at the supplier resilience and then the mitigation assessment. <clears throat> I've also shown you how you can click edit to switch in and, and make changes to any of these questions and answers. 
this just talks a little bit more about the algorithms in the in the back of the um, back of the toolkit. Um, so straight away you can see that it really focuses hard on the gross profit dependency and the um, the significance of <coughs> of the gross profit. So if it's under 10%, it's determined low. Um, between 10 and 24%, it's medium, and then 25% on over, it, it's classed as high dependency. And these are these all the questions, and again, these are all weighted depending on the uh, on the on the results. This is how the form looks. So that supplier form that I showed you earlier, this is what it's seen from a supplier point of view. So they get this email that comes through, a little bit of intro text, and then with just a web link to the page, and then it just opens up these questions. <coughs> and you'll also see that the word in the questions have been changed as well. So for instance, is this business one of your top five customers? If you go back into the screen, it wasn't worded like that. So it's all been properly thought through. And again, this is the bit about the mitigation, about the buffer stock, if supply is interrupted, do you have multiple suppliers? And again, the answer is scored and weighted, and you get good, fair, or poor. <coughs> So generally, in summary, it looks at the gross profit, it looks at the supplier resilience, it looks at the current mitigation. The tool uses algorithm um, to determine the scores. And then it helps to signpost businesses and insurers to understand which suppliers will cause most impact on the business if they fail to, fail to deliver. And then this is just a, an, another random um, dashboard when we're in the testing stage and again it can just show we've got this um, rag brawler here which shows how many assessments are so you've just seen for my bad sea potatoes I've got three outstanding at the moment and then it ranks it by high medium or low risk <coughs> and then straight away if you've got an impact on gross profit more than 25% straight away that's being classed as a high risk high risk supplier even if the supplier resilience and the mitigation assessment are, are good or high <coughs> and then you have your page for all your suppliers and the assessment statuses as well so straight away you can see if any of the um, assessments are TBC or still outstanding and then we've talked through some of the um, some of the guidance notes that we have, including the the new supply chain management. Just to finish, we do offer um, risk authority members branded versions of the tool. We've had some interest in this already from MS Amlin, RSA, NIG. All we need is your logo, your kind of palette. Um, we can change lots of the elements. This wallpaper design in the background can change. We can even change um, the footer pages, such as privacy notice, terms and conditions, cookie policy. <coughs> if you felt the 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 versions that are on the risk authority site weren't strong enough or weren't stringent enough. But like I said earlier on in my in my presentation, these have been written and reviewed by FPA solicitors and, and we're pretty confident that they're, they're, they're of sound quality. <clears throat> just a little bit more just on the software and hosting so this is all cloud based so there's no software update or patches to users so it's consistent supply. It uses the latest data encryption software so it all sits on Microsoft Azure. Again I've talked about the data security wording policies We've got full hosting and support contract in place with the developers, and it's been built with responsive design, so it's accessible on all modern devices and platforms. <coughs> and we've done a bit of press on this as well. So to industry, Jim Connie put a piece on LinkedIn. It's all on the FBA Risk Authority websites. I've written a really nice article, even if I say so myself, in the May issue of FRM, which you should definitely get a copy of and have a read of. 
we've created various adverts and, and banners. <coughs> I've going to leave instruction to Miffy to hopefully enter this into some sort of supply chain awards. The webinar has been done. I'm not speaking at Firex on supply chain disruptions, but um, you know, hope, hopefully someone will later on. And that's the end of the mo webinar. Um, thank you for joining and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.